Okay, great. So um, I am going to share my screen with you all. And um, you should be able to see each other, but, but I want I you to see this presentation too. Okay, I can see. All right, so uh, we're going to try to uh, utilize this training to s help you select leaders according to God's will. And um, have all of you been on a nominating committee before? I have not. You have not? That's probably the one thing you haven't done with this church, John. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but anyway, that's, that's one of them. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to be doing in this training, this, uh, the agenda is uh, we're going to discuss the meaning of call and uh, we're going to uh, kind of get into the details of what a called leader of our church should look like. And then finally, we'll uh, take a look at the nuts and bolts of how you will do your work as a, a committee. So, um, what is a call? Um, what does it mean to be called? Now, just just open the floor to anybody who has a, a sense of what the answer is. Well, that means to be asked, in this essence, to be asked to listen to your heart, listen to what you think might be God's will and purpose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then make your decision based on those things. Right, right. Okay. So that's what it means to me. Yeah, okay. Good. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Grace. I just said I think that's good. Mm -hmm. um, is being called something that comes from within or from without? I guess in this instance, it's more like that God is calling you to do something. So that would be you know, that would be from him, not, not something that I, I called you and asked you to do, but it would be something that God asked you or, or wanted you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's right. And that's kind of more of the root meaning of the word call, all right? You don't call yourself um, because you are conscious of your own uh, mind and your own presence and, and what... Uh, you're uh, mindful of your own agenda, but uh, when somebody who, who wants to get your attention, they call you. They say, hey, John, hey, Nancy, hey, Grace, mm -hmm. I want you to do this. And uh, it doesn't necessarily fit with what your plans are. Okay, so, um, what are the other ways that we acquire leaders? Uh, we elect. Mm-hmm. Um, we ask. We just ask mm -hmm. people to, to serve in different capacities. Mm-hmm. Right. How were kings made back when kings were, were the, the way that uh, the people were governed? Well, um, they were ushered in by their, um, by who they, their, by their families, by the, by the family they belonged to. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of, of English being mm -hmm. tutors or, uh, they, they, other, inherit, they inherited, mm -hmm. uh, they, they uh, inherited the job. Yeah, I guess so. Right. 
now uh and inheriting uh you know is kind of went to great lengths sometimes i mean you know you would have uh the throne be suddenly uh vacated without uh a clear heir and so you'd have to go through bloodlines to find out who would be the next person in line to, to inherit the throne mm -hmm. right right yeah so uh that's uh, called primogeniture the the idea that the first child of a family uh would uh, be the inheritor from the parents but uh there are also uh, instances like in the bible when kings were raised up among the people right we ha we had Saul the first mm -hmm. king of Israel he w was raised up among the people uh and uh, the story of Saul uh, is that uh, the people wanted a king and uh, Samuel, who was the prophet for the people, who kind of had a leadership role, uh, thought it was a really bad idea. But God spoke to Saul, said, go ahead and let them have a king. And Saul, uh, Samuel said, okay, but you're going to have to, well, actually what God said, Samuel, go to these, uh, this family and I will tell you who this, the person is that will be king. And so it was kind of uh, part of Saul's or Samuel's uh, priestly duty to uh, help the people select the king. And, and uh, from that time forward, God always had a hand in selecting the king. And if, if you remember uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, she was anointed in the tradition of Saul and David and all the other successive kings of the Israelites, and then later the Israelites and the Judahites. So uh, there's election, there's uh, succession uh, by inheritance, and then there's also kind of an informal thing that you hope that God's involved helping to raise a person. That's uh, why uh, when Jesus, uh, the time where, when Jesus lived during the uh, Roman occupation of the area of Palestine, there were a lot of people looking for messiahs. And uh, they kind of equated messiahs with people that could stir up excitement amongst the people and uh, consequently, there were a lot of false messiahs. And uh, Jesus even spoke a little bit about that, uh, that uh, by, your, by their fruits, you shall know them. So anyway, that's, uh, those are the methods. Um, let's see here, I'm having trouble. There we go. One of the benefits of seeking people who are called the Ministry of Leadership. Well, I would say it's a democratic way uh, to be called because you get a, a cross-section of, perhaps cross-section of people in the church to go to the meeting, or of course they have already talked about, I'm sure, at length. Um, so uh, you're thinking of how we elect our elders and supposedly our nominating committee- Committee, um, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, is uh, going to seek the best representation of the congregation in the leaders that it nominates. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but think about what has to happen before that, before the nominating committee puts together their slate. They're seeking people and they're seeking people who are called to the ministry of leadership. Who's, who's doing the calling if we're doing our job right? God's doing the calling. 
Right. And if we only seek people who God calls, then what are the benefits of doing that? Well, if God calls them, then you know that they are equipped and up to the task. And you would, you would think that they would be, if not, you know, necessarily, um, you know, naturals at it or whatever, that they would be passionate and persistent about the task um, <laughs> rather than, rather than just looking at it as a job or, uh, you know, so, something that has to be done. It would be something that they, you know, feel committed to or strongly about. I think that's exactly right, John. If, if you uh, are careful to discern what God is doing and calling somebody and, and you feel that the person that you're, you're approaching is called to that ministry by God, then there's really very little wrong that can happen. Because <laughs> God is, is selecting a particular person at a particular time in the life of the church to do particular work. And uh, they may not have been the most experienced or the most skilled, but like you alluded to, they may have a passion that they may never have even realized they had until they were put in the right circumstances. And, and you know, given the work of the Holy Spirit, they uh, were a, the exact right person. And that's not anything you can figure out. You have to rely on God. Thank you all for that. That's great. Okay, so roles of the called. Um, what are, just think about the people who were called in the Bible. Can, can you rattle off a few characters' names in the Bible who were called? Moses. Moses was called. What was, what was his role as a leader? <clears throat> Well, Moses had to lead the people out of Egypt, and if I recall correctly, he complained and said he wasn't very good at speaking and wasn't really <laughs> well equipped to, uh, to do sure that. Did. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, give me a, a second here. Um, I am going to, I, I think somebody is wanting in, so I'm going to try to uh, get them admitted. Let's see. Yeah, all right. Cameron wants in. All right. Let's see. I'm waiting for him to get on board. Cameron, can you hear us? Yes, I'm waiting. Okay, great, good. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, Grace Fischel and John Shives and Nancy Crow on board with I'm us. Hello. Hi. Um, it, it's fine to turn on your video if you want, or if you're, you're afraid you're going to scare us with your hairdo or something. <laughs> <laughs> can't be any worse than mine. All right, so uh, I'm in the middle of, uh, of a presentation here, and so we'll just go ahead and resume. We are recording this, so you'll be able to catch up with the part that you missed, all right? So uh, we talked about Moses, any other uh, people in uh, the Bible that you can recall were called? How about Joseph? Well, Joseph uh, in Genesis, Joseph? Yeah. The, the yeah. second to last Joseph son. Of, the coat yeah. of many colors, Joseph. Right. Um, yeah, what, what role was he called to? Well, I'm, let me, I'm running my head through the story. Um, well, he was called to one of leadership when he was in Egypt. Mm -hmm. But then I think it was the, um, 
reconciliation with his family and bringing them to uh, God and to each other. Yeah, yeah, I think there that was, may not be right. That's just what I'm thinking. Well, I think that was the net effect of, of what his leadership role mm -hmm. was able to uh, do. And, and um, <clears throat> as far as his own family was concerned, mm -hmm. um, he did affect the reconciliation and uh, the power, the power that he had was that uh, his brothers knew that they had wronged him. True. And uh, his ability to forgive was the power that he had as far as, as they were mm -hmm. concerned. Yeah. And, and so so he, he was called to that role, I think. That, uh, he, well, and, and, and he would be an example to others based on his forgiveness and his you know, those other kinds of things as well, mm -hmm. I think. Right. The other one I was thinking about was Paul. Paul was called. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, Absolutely. that was, yeah. Um, Jesus literally called the disciples, didn't he? Yeah, true. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. So the disciples yeah. uh, were, as the, the name disciples indicates, they were followers, but eventually, they became apostles, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, being uh, called doesn't necessarily mean that your current status in whatever circumstance you are, you know, supposed to be working in is going to be where you end up in life. You, you, uh, a calling is maybe an invitation to grow. So uh, there's all kinds of uh, roles that God calls leaders to. Um, think about the roles that leaders have taken in our nation. What was, uh, what was Franklin Roosevelt's role besides just being president? What, what do you think his, uh, from a uh, relationship standpoint with the people of the United States, what was his role? Well, I think he had a lot to do with bringing us out of a recession, of you know, an economic recession. Mm -hmm. I think so. he did too, yeah. And emotionally, what, what was the effect of, of his work as president, what was the emotional effect? Remember, the, have, no, I was just going to say, would it have to do with his physical limitations and the fact that he was able to to overcome those? Well, I think that would be an inspiration for people who knew him after he was president. But, um, yeah. He uh, he was not really uh, very candid as far as... No, he tried to hide it, I right, understand. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was during wartime, so mm -hmm. um, a good bit. So I don't know if that was what you were referring to. Right. Well, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. Remember those fireside chats he would have? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't personally remember them. Neither but. do I. <laughs> I do. I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, did, what was the feeling? I can't of tell you exactly what he said now. He was, but. Trying, to, he was trying to get morale up. <laughs> right, exactly, John. And, or was that John or Cameron? That was Cameron. Oh, okay, Cameron. So you, you, you understand what those fireside chats were mm -hmm. meant to do. And so uh, 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 Roosevelt was a person who not only uh, you know, set up all these programs to get the nation uh, moving again uh, and to build infrastructure. He uh, was also kind of like a father figure to the country and uh, just was kind of uh, the person who was always assuring the people that better days were ahead. 
So, uh, and you think about uh, um, Ronald Reagan. He was the great communicator, right? He was, mm -hmm. he was the person who was able to, to speak uh, plainly to people and, and give the, the nation a, a sense of direction. Um, Harry Truman, uh, he was kind of a plain speaker. Uh, he, uh, but he also brought uh, Midwestern sensibility to some very complex problems, um, like uh, the uh, the arms race, uh, what to do uh, when you're just getting out of a war and then being thrust into another war. Um, he uh, he had some very uh, and. Uh, when the uh, world felt like they needed to gather together and do something about stopping wars, he was very much involved in, in getting the United Nations uh, off of its, you know, on its feet. And uh, so we have a lot of international uh, understandings between countries as a result of the work that Harry Truman along with others did. So, so, uh, in our nation, I think that uh, God calls particular people in particular times to do particular work. So think about the, the roles that leaders in our church have taken. There's some uh, obvious uh, roles. We have officers in our church. We have the clerk of session who records the minutes of our meetings and tends to be somebody who uh, sweats the details. Uh, we have a treasurer who is kind of uh, the person who uh, makes sure all the, all the gears are, of the church are well-oiled and, and moving smoothly. Um, what other roles can you think of, formal or informal? Moderators of committees, mm -hmm. um, Presbyterian women, uh, is there a, a, a particular role you can think of amongst the Presbyterian women? That... Well, there are many roles, but there's the moderator and of the Presbyterian women, and then their officers secretary and treasurer and then various committee chairs. So it's a, a rather involved group. And then within the circles, we have the uh, Bible moderators. I'm sorry, I muted myself and forgot. Um, the uh, um, Each one of those people kind of have a certain, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't go and select somebody who wasn't, who didn't seem suited for that particular role to do that. Yeah, that's, that's true, I think. And so you have kind of a, a, a characteristic, uh, a list of traits that you have in your mind that helps you match up a person with a particular leadership position. I think you do, and, and yeah. we all have different gifts, of course, so you look for that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, let me ask you a question. Um, what part does discovery have in calling somebody to a leadership role? John uh, kind of caught on to this earlier. Um, so what, what, what part does discovery have? I would say in the truest sense that really, um, it's not something that, you know, that, that you have to look for. You don't have to look for traits in somebody, um, to call them. Um, and I wouldn't say that maybe sometimes the person who is called even knows, you know, that they have those traits. If, you know, if God is, God is responsible for the process, um, you sort of discover that at the time, you know, it, it, it comes out 
at that time or or as time you know goes forward that's how you the that's how the discovery process comes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's not it's not something that necessarily is known to everyone that oh he would be a great whatever because he is very well spoken or she would be excellent at this task because she is so well organized it's more Mm -hmm. of a you know god has this in mind for this person and that's how it all works out Great. So uh, I think uh, we would all agree that discovery does have a part in calling somebody to leadership. We don't necessarily, um, we can't perceive everything about a person and know for sure that uh, they are going to be suited for a particular role. That, But we can lean on God to let us know about, about people who would be part- particularly well suited for a role at a particular time. Do you think God directs us sometimes to people I think to, he, help them, to help them develop their gift or give, develop that, that maybe they're not even aware that that was something that they would be able to do? Oh, I definitely feel that way. Yeah. I, I do too. That's why. Mm-hmm. I, I was uh, the moderator of the appointments committee for First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro, which was responsible for uh, selecting the nominating committee, who, of course, you know, it's the same committee that you all are, that was responsible for selecting a slate of elders, but also the appointments committee was responsible for placing uh, committee moderators with committees for 15 committees of session. And wow. yeah, it, it, we also uh, set the, the vice moderators and uh, then we also uh, p- found people uh, that the moderator might want to place on their committee. So we had we had a lot of, uh, of plus the fact that the, the board of trustees was a separate entity from the session. So we we looked for a president of the corporation and a secretary and and treasurer and and all the trustee positions in the board of trustees. So it it was uh, it, it, it that that being on that committee made you sweat we were the we were the workhorses of of the church and i remember we would run into situations where where it didn't seem like the right choice to select this person to be the moderator of a committee but it was all the other doors were shut and so we went for the door that was open and uh, it worked out. Um, sometimes it didn't work out, obviously, but it did work out in the long run because um, you're thinking about the entire uh, um, what the the life uh, you know of of the committee and and how it affects the the entire ministry of of the church and and and. Those things, like I say, they just kind of work out. It, you know, it, you're not always going to have uh, uh, a, a, an amazing leader in a particular committee, but maybe that gives other committees a chance to get caught up or to figure out some things. So things are coordinated in by some miracle, by you know. So it, it's you you can look back at things and 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 uh see that sometimes so does that answer your question nancy it does Mm -hmm. does. all right so what part does a person's skill set in having in calling a person to a role depends on the role i think uh if you need a treasurer then 
I think it's obvious that you would hope to find someone who has that type of skill, skill in working with numbers and yes, yes. yeah, counting or. <clears throat> So it's not necessarily all one th thing or another mm -mm. and each particular role that you're considering is is going to be different too so i i just offer these as things to consider as you're thinking of people to fill the leadership roles of the church so now i want to run through rather quickly um the book of order tells us about what a leader should be. And here's the citation. Um, the ministry of members, membership in the church of Jesus Christ is a joy and a privilege. It is also a commitment to participate in Christ's mission. A faithful member bears witness to God's love and grace and promises to be involved responsibly in the ministry of Christ Church. Such involvement includes proclaiming the good news in word and deed, taking part in the common life and worship of a congregation, lifting one another up in prayer, mutual concern and active support, studying scripture and the issues of Christian faith and life, supporting the ministry of the church through the giving of money, time and talents demonstrating a new quality of life within and through the church, responding to God's activity in the world through service to others, living responsibly in the personal, family, vocational, political, cultural, and social relationships of life, working in the world for peace, justice, freedom, and human fulfillment, participating in the governing responsibilities of church, and reviewing and evaluating rarely the integrity of one's membership and considering ways in which one's participation in the worship and service of the church may be increased and made more meaningful. All right, so is there anybody who's a member of the church that you think personifies all of these marks of membership? <laughs> well. I, I certainly think we have some. That oh, do you? Okay. All right. Well, um, I think we, uh, I, I'm not going to argue with you, Nancy, but I think it's unfair to think that we should expect every single member of the church. Mm -mm -mm. To, no, I didn't. No, just, I don't think so. Mm -mm. To exemplify all these marks. All right. No. I th I, the, the thing I should have said before I started reading uh, these <laughs> marks was that they, these traits include, so that means they are neither exhaustive, nor does it mean that a particular person exhibits all of these traits. That it, but it does, uh, these are kind of listed as ways that people can um, realize membership in a congregation and uh, how they can exhibit their faith. So uh, these are the ways that, uh, you know, if it, a, a person that you're considering for uh, a leadership role should exhibit at least some of these. If they exhibit none of these, then it might not be a good choice, this particular person. All right. Uh, then uh, something else from the Book of Order. This is the gifts and qualifications of an elder, a ruling elder, I should say. So uh, they are supposed to be persons of strong faith. They're supposed to be persons of dedicated discipleship. And they are supposed to uh, have a love of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So uh, these are things that you know they're not really specific but they are uh indicate that the person is not just somebody who warms a pew that they have an active spiritual life so the duties of a ruling elder according to the book of order 
Ruling elders are so named not because they lord it over the congregation, but because they are chosen by the congregation to discern and measure its fidelity to the word of God and to strengthen and nurture its faith in life. So uh, that is a responsibility. Now, luckily, I think our congregation shares that responsibility so well that uh, I don't know that our session has to worry about uh, the congregation's fidelity to the word of God. Would you agree? I would. Yeah. But it's not always the case in all churches. And so the session is kind of the, uh, the gatekeeper, the, uh, the arbitrator, not the arbitrator, but somebody who is always kind of warily looking at the spiritual life of the church and making sure that it is the best it possibly can be. And not uh, so they can lord it over the congregation or set themselves up as a, as a judge of the congregation, but so they can uh, consider this a problem that they can actively uh, endeavor to solve. So, uh, and I, you know, when I was an elder at, at First Presbyterian Church, I would get approached by people who would say, did you know this? And the church was so large that very often I would say, no, I didn't know that. And then I'd have to decide, well, what do I need to do about that? You know, but uh, those uh, things were, are things that come up uh, from time to time, because we don't always know what every piece and part of our congregation is doing at any given time. It's easier with the smaller church, obviously. Um, ruling elders together with teaching elders, that's me, uh, exercise leadership, government, spiritual discernment and discipline and have responsibilities for the life of a congregation as well as the whole church including ecumenical relationships so that's another duty we we uh, uh i share uh with the session with each of the ruling elders uh the um, responsibility of leadership So when an elder is elected by the congregation, they shall serve faithfully as members of the session. When elected as commissioners to higher councils, ruling elders participate and vote with the same authority as teaching elders, and they are eligible for any office. So when you select an elder, that person uh, is able and uh, sometimes called to serve in uh, more inclusive bodies above the session. Um, I have not served on a committee with any of our church members in uh, New Hope Presbytery, but I hope to someday. I hope uh, that uh, somebody will feel called to serve on a committee uh, at the Presbytery level, or maybe at the Synod or the General Assembly level. So that, that would be a wonderful thing for our congregation. Yeah. Um, all right, some rules of, to follow. These are the kind of uh, the things that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking of people, because there are certain things that will disqualify a person. Um, ruling elders and deacons, we don't have a diaconate, so you can ignore that part, shall be elected to serve terms of no more than three years on the session or board of deacons, and may be eligible for re-election according to congregational rules. And then in parentheses, I indicate what our congregational rule is, which it does not allow consecutive terms. So if somebody is rotating off of session this year, you cannot select them to be on the slate of nominees uh, coming up. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no ruling elder or deacon shall be eligible to serve more than six consecutive years. All right, that's not an issue with us. Uh, 
election shall be to classes as nearly equal in number as possible with a term of only one class ending each year. That's these, these are all things that are just general uh, and coming from the book of order. So uh, we have had an instance since I've been here where they could not find four people and they elected, they had the congregation elect a, a three person class. But uh, <clears throat> you, uh, we normally will have four, pe four people in a, in a nominee, in a nominating slate or nominated slate. All right, so the constitutional questions. Um, some of you all have all had to answer these in a, uh, at when you were uh, ordained or installed. So these are the things that you are going to have to uh, present to each person that you talk to uh, if uh, they are interested in serving the church they need to be able to answer in the in the affirmative all nine of these questions and um, I have a feeling that I'm running out of time and so or uh, I'm, I'm a little bit behind so I'm just going to uh, kind of quickly go through these uh, actually I'm just going to refer you to them uh, when you do your work. So, <laughs> so y'all are going to have to get a book of uh, order and, uh, and uh, carry that with you when you talk or, or have one with you when you talk to somebody on the phone and, and, and go over these questions with them. Because if, if they can't answer affirmatively to all these questions, then you can stop uh, pursuing that person. I expect we all have a book of order of our own. I right. Have <laughs> and, and these questions haven't changed, you know, ever since. I have, excuse me. I'm sorry, Jen. That's I all right. have never, I have never been asked those questions when I was called, nor have I asked anyone those questions when I was on the nominating committee. I see. Well, you guys will maybe decide that it's not necessarily a big issue. Um, I know it's part of the training that I do uh, mm -hmm. for elder, new elders, but uh, if, if you have a suspicion that it's gonna be a sticking point for somebody, you better figure that out before they get on the slate. Right, Yeah. I, and, I, okay. and again, I think with a, a small church like we have, Mm -hmm. We know each other more intimately than you do in a larger church. Right. So I think you know yeah. in most of the people you would be talking to their heart and their beliefs. And but like you say, if you if you had any doubts, you could certainly ask. Right. Right. Okay. Expectations. All right. These are just things I kind of threw out there uh, that you might want to make sure people understand before they decide, yes, I'll be a nominee. Um, attend session meetings. That seems to be obvious. Faithfully attend worship. Be active in the life of the church. Make offerings to the church of time and treasure as part of a personal covenant of growth and faith. Facilitate the serving of communion. Lead the session in a devotion. Those were just some of the things I, and you might be able to think of others. All right, uh, now the task of being the nominating committee. Uh, here is the statement that helps you uh, understand that we're supposed to have a representative selection of nominees. Ruling elders and deacons are men and women elected by the congregation from among its members. The nomination and election of ruling elders and deacons shall express the rich diversity of the congregation's membership and shall guarantee participation and inclusiveness. Ruling elders and deacons shall be nominated by a committee elected by the congregation, that's you, drawn from and representative of its membership. So, and I've got a little uh, worksheet that will help you do this work. 
uh, confidentiality. Very, very important that you never share who you're considering as a nominee without, with anyone other than other people on the committee until the slate is ready to pre be presented publicly to the session and the congregation. So confidentiality is very, very important. Um, invitation methods. You're going to have to figure out how uh, you're going to uh, invite people. Uh, and be careful to understand, you know, to not slip into the thinking that you're not getting somebody to fill a slot. You're trying to find the person that God is calling. And sometimes that person may be hard to get. And that's why I include this little parenthetical. Remember the persistence of God when he was calling Moses. He didn't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so also listen for responses from the people that you talk to. Do they understand the responsibilities? Some may be excited. And so how do you celebrate this? You know, how do you, you know, uh, join in their excitement. Some people may be uh, concerned about the life of the church and the direction that the church is going. So there, you need to not only uh, uh, honor that concern with that person, but you need to kind of uh, offer their issues up as something for the entire body to consider. And that might be, uh, that might shape how you select people. Um, all right, so this is what I'm calling the nitty gritty. Uh, how many positions do you have to fill? You've got four. And uh, you've got to uh, make the congregation aware that you are doing your work and that you are soliciting recommendations from them so they feel involved in the process. And they should be uh, part of the beginning, all right? So it's not, it's not necessarily a good idea to start your work and then say, oh, by the way, the congregation, we gotten somebody uh, suggested from a congregation member. That you should begin your work having that information ahead of you, in, in front of you, at, in other words, uh, so you can give equal uh, consideration to all the people that you're thinking of. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that way, uh, if those persons, you know, if somebody makes a selection and comes back to you and say, well, that person didn't make it on the slate, what happened? And, you know, because of confidentiality, you can't really explain all the nitty gritty, but you can say, you can assure them and say, yes, we got your suggestion and we considered them alongside all the other people who were uh, considered and we prayed about it and uh, we felt led to go a particular direction and that didn't include your suggestion. And I think that's, nobody can fault you for, for, for taking that approach. Um, so you need to send out word via email, announcements and the worship bulletin. And also you need to have a deadline for responses from the congregation so you can get to work. Um, when will you meet and how? Um, I know Grace, you were uh, willing to offer your home as, as a meeting place, but I, I would suggest that you uh, meet via Zoom um, or a uh, conference call because each one of your phones, you can do a conference call. Um, but uh, I can definitely organize Zoom meetings for you guys. And I will, although I'm able to sit in, I will probably start the meeting and then excuse myself because I, I implicitly trust you guys to do the work that you're called to do. And uh, unless you have a question uh, there, I don't, re that requires my presence in a meeting, I, I probably won't attend your meetings. 
as a rule. Um, so when discussing members of the church, people may get tripped up over their desire to be nice. You don't mm -hmm. ever want to be the person that says something bad about another person. But the, the thing about it is that uh, there's a difference between uh, um, unnecessarily or gratuitously ungenerous about a person and being frank uh, and f just uh, sharing information that the entire body can benefit from about a person's qualifications or disqualifications. So uh, you're using your judgment to select leaders, but you're not judging a person as being good or bad. You are trying to get it right as far as selecting people whom God is calling. And uh, there may be obvious indicators that tell you that a particular person is not called. And when, if, a, if one of you know that, but the other people in the committee don't know that, then you should share it. And it, as frankly, but without any kind of, of you know, meanness or, and, and no, sh no one should attach the sense of being uh, mean to what gets discussed. You just should have an atmosphere of being able to discuss openly the attributes of each person that you're considering. All right, reasons to avoid, or let's see, yeah, things that, that kind of come up as a matter of the committee discussing and, and doing its work that you should avoid. Uh, it's been a while since they served, so we need to give them a chance to serve again or that the, they're, they've been s sitting on their duffs too long and, and we need to put them back to work. <laughs> not always, not, not always uh, uh, coincident with a call. Uh, this person needs to do their share, kind of uh, the same thing, only different. Uh, we may get them active through election to an office. This is the way Denise uh, uh, tries to get people involved in choir. She, she uh, tries to get them involved in, in ancillary things to the choir. Uh, John, I think uh, you were part of the choir for just one little thing. Uh, when the men were singing a, a piece of music, it, uh, but uh, obviously you didn't feel called to the choir. So, <laughs> so we were very happy for your time with us, but uh, that didn't that didn't stick. That didn't uh, that didn't feel like a call to you. So, uh, but this is not the way you do that kind of work. You um, you don't you don't put them on the nominating slate uh, with the hope that they'll get more active. These people should already be active. Um, this person has never been elected. Not a good reason. Um, it is a way to honor a particular person. We have other ways of honoring people. Um, and being on session is, is work and we should, we, it's not a laurel. Um, what committee officer vacancy do we need to fill? All right, this is kind of a fill the slot fill the mentality. mentality. So, so we need to avoid that. So, uh, Questions to ask when considering a candidate. Do they ex exhibit the marks of mem membership? Do they exhibit the gifts and qualifications of a ruling elder? Is he or she able to carry out the duties of a ruling elder? In other words, are they able to attend the meetings? Uh, does their work take them out of town a significant portion of the time and make it hard for them to, to do the work? on session. Has the person had experiences that provided preparation for leadership? In other words, have they served in other uh, parts of the life of the church that would help prepare them to be on the session? And how has the Holy Spirit moved? Probably the most important 
question to ask. Um, so you're going to have to figure out your methods for contacting people. Will you make a phone call? I, I hardly recommend that um, in light of uh, the current restrictions that we're living under. Um, but uh, you can uh, decide if you want to do things in pairs or do things uh, individually. That's something you're all going to have to sort out. What will you do to communicate? What are the things that a particular person should have in them? Uh, before they uh, should say yes to uh, being put on the slate. I remember when I uh, was approached by the nominating committee of First Church Greensboro, they came to my house and they said, Joe, your name has come up and we, uh, we know some of the things that you do and uh, that has excited us about the possibility of you serving. However, there's more to being an elder than just that. And I'd like to show you this list and I want you to read this and we'll just sit here and wait for you to finish reading and see if these things uh, are things that you feel comfortable uh, that you have or that you feel comfortable learning to do. And uh, so that was very helpful. That had kind of set out from the very beginning, what were the expectations of the church for me as a leader of the church? So also you're gonna need to coordinate your contacts because uh, you're going to prioritize who you're gonna call and you don't want to be calling two people for the same role at the same time. <laughs> that would be that that will turn out to be disaster. Because if they both accept, then what are you going to do? Could <laughs> could be bad. Um, so you're going to have to make sure you coordinate that. And then uh, when people are contacted or, or given a contact to make, there has to be a deadline attached with that. So you say, you're going to go contact uh, Charles Atlas about being on session and you need to give uh, us word back, yay or nay, uh, by Friday. And uh, then we can do our uh, call our next person if Charles doesn't say yes. That way the, the work of the nominating committee can progress at a, at a fairly good pace. All right, so now I'm show you this grid of representation. All right, so um, we don't have minorities in our congregation except for Greg Batchelor. And uh, Greg, is, I, I, uh, I don't worry about uh, uh, trying to represent Greg in that uh, he, he would be the only person who could rep represent himself as, as a black person. And uh, he's just not of, in, I, I, I'm making this assessment, he's just not ready to be in a leadership role in the church. You may feel differently, but that's this, so that's how I've set up the grid. Um, and uh, we don't have any people that are under the age of 40 in our membership, unfortunately. So I've divided the age groups into two, those who are under 60 and those who are 60 and over and then those who are male and female. So you got this four cell grid um, and you already have some people in those categories. Notice that uh, females under 60 are uppers underrepresented. So uh, that might be the first uh, category that you try to fill. Um, you are uh, you have four people rotating off, so those people are off limits, Jimmy, Jimmy and Nancy and, and Mary and Wally. Um, but uh, you are evenly uh, distributed between male and female. You have uh, four people who are male and four people who are female. So you only have uh, a bare spot in the female under 60 category. 
and uh, if you get two males and two females in your nominating class, then you're uh, nominated in your slate, in other words, then you'll be just uh, fine as uh, you'll be all set. Um, let's see what's next. And that, that is the end of the presentation. How about that? Um, Sounds good. Well, good, good. Do y'all have any questions? <clears throat> what is our uh, deadline as far as presenting to the congregation? Isn't that September? Yes, we we really need to have uh, a slate to vote on by September. Gotcha. Um, you can look at the uh, church officer manual and look at the the kind of the schedule of events at a glance. It's that it's in the first part of the officer manual to, to tell you exactly. Okay. Um, and I can show that to you. Let me see. It's okay. I just, I thought it was September. Right. And there's also the duties of the nominating committee that describe in great detail uh, what your, what your schedule should be. So, um, I can provide you with copies of this presentation. I can provide you with uh, a list of all the church members uh, and their ages. Um, I can provide you with, um, well, I can provide you with one more thing. Um, and this is uh, the way that I, urge you to consider uh, selecting your nominees. And I'm going to show this to you real quick. Okay, so what you see before you is a spreadsheet. It's very simple. It has uh, the candidates that you're going to consider for a particular role, all right? Say it's the, uh, the, 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 the role that we talked about, the, the females un, uh, under 60, all right? So you all will s sit down or in a conference call or a Zoom meeting, uh, just kind of throw out names of people who are in that category. And then you'll put them in these blocks, their names. And then you all will, will discuss them and pray about them. And then you'll take a vote. And each one of you will vote for your favorite person and you'll give that person a two. And then you'll vote for your next favorite person and you'll give that person a one. And then uh, you'll go down the, each member of the committee to give their vote and notice that you have two votes for your favorite person is a two point and your next favorite person is one point and you only vote for one more you, you have two votes for every one position or one more vote than you do have positions that you're considering you follow I'm, me? I, I'm not following that okay it's all in it's described, it's described in this note. Suppose okay. that you are, uh, you have satisfied selecting all of the people that you can get for females under 60, all right? So mm -hmm. you, and you've got two females, one's under 60, one's not, all right? Then you, you have the ability to select your male candidates, all right? And rather than, uh, choosing each person individually, you, you uh, decide that uh, if they're in the category of 60 or under or, or 60 and over, you don't really, you're not going to uh, worry about that so much. So you can select two candidates. You, you can vote for two candidates, all right? Or in other words, you want 
to come out with two candidates to uh, approach. All right. Yeah. And, and the way you do that is you vote for three. You vote for your favorite, your next favorite, and your third favorite. Okay. And that way you have a chance of uh, if somebody declines, then you've got other people that you can pick on. And of course, uh, you start by tallying everybody's votes and the one with the most points is going to be your first choice. The one with the second most points is going to be your second person to call. And the okay. one with the third most points is going to be your third person to call. Okay, got it. So this, this, I remember when I was on the appointments committee and somebody else did it, just uh, a one person, one vote type thing. And it just mm -hmm. took forever. And, and this is so much easier because you can rank everything right from the get go. And it, this is called uh, weighted balloting. Okay. And, and there's a, there's a consideration, uh, there's a bill that isn't going anywhere right now, but it's uh, uh, actually uh, part of it is to uh, enable states to and counties to uh, do a version of weighted balloting. Hmm. It's, it's done a little bit differently, but, but it's the same uh, strategy. So uh, that way you can't have a situation where there's a spoiler uh, candidate that takes w votes away from, from the other two mainline candidates. And so that way, uh, if you, the first, if a person's favorite doesn't get elected, then chances are somebody they voted for will get elected. And some, and the chances are far better that somebody that a majority of votes, either of their favorite vote or their second favorite or third favorite, will will actually uh, be selected to be the leader. It's it's just to avoid the kind of spoiler effect that a third party vote, a uh, third party candidate, can sometimes uh, create. <sighs> all right, I'm all talked out here. Um, what uh, <laughs> are there any questions, concerns? Well, I would like to have the list that you were talking about. Sure. Okay. What what I the people list. in the church and their ages. Yes. That's okay. I, I me will. too, and I the presentation as well. Yeah. Copy the presentation. All right, yes. fine. Yes. Um, I took a lot of notes, but I know I missed stuff. Sure, sure. And I'll give you a link to the uh, the video. Of, of okay. This. All right. So it sounds like everybody's set. Do I get a nod or a thumbs up? <laughs> You're set. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you, Joe. You're yeah, thank you, guys. You're very welcome. Y'all take care. Thank you too. Bye. Bye. Yes, Grace. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy, for your help. <laughs>